Good day, everyone. Welcome to Church Online. We're going to start by listening to what Jesus has to say in John chapter 8, verse 12. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Powerful words, profound words. Here stands Jesus in the middle of the temple, Jewish leaders staring at him, crowds of people gathered all the way to celebrate the festival of lights. And here stands a Jewish carpenter and says to the Jewish leaders, if you follow me, you will not walk in darkness. You will have the light of life. Friends, Jesus did experience darkness. He experienced darkness when he died for us on the cross, but he didn't remain dead. He rose up from the grave. And He is alive and He gives us eternal life. Our hope for you today is that you would experience that soul-satisfying, abundant life. My name is Paul and wherever you are tuning in from, we're so glad that you could join us. Can I just say a special welcome to you if this is your first time? I would love to hear from you. We'd love to connect with you. Would you please jump on our website, click on the tab that says I'm new and there you'll have an option to connect with us. Please drop us a line. Let us know that you were there. Now, just on that note, can I just say that in two weeks' time, we'll be launching three services, our physical gatherings, right here at 154 Balcata Road in Balcata. 8.30, 10.30, and 6 p.m. We'd love to see you there. Now, here's what you can expect today. In a couple of minutes, we'll be singing a few songs. Then we'll hear about what the kids will be doing in Term 3. And then the highlight of our gatherings is always listening to God's voice as we look at His Word. Today we'll be digging into the book of Ecclesiastes, trying to understand what is wisdom, what does a wise person look like. But before we do that, how about we pray and commit our time together. Please join with me. Gracious Heavenly Father, You haven't left us in the dark. You brought us uh, from darkness into light through your son, Jesus Christ. He died, he rose again, he's alive, and he gives us hope beyond the grave. Would you help us? Would you help us today as we we listen to your, your word a bit later? Would you speak to us? Would you prepare our hearts as we sing? Would you help us? The words that we sing, help us to think about those words. Father, would you work in our hearts today? Draw us closer to you. We commit our time together to you. In your name and for your glory we pray. Amen. Here is love as does the ocean Loving kindness as the fly When the prince of life our ransom Shed for us his precious blood Here is love, here is love Fast as the ocean Loving kindness as the flood when the prince of life our ransom shed for us his precious blood who is love will not remember who can cease to sing his praise he can never be
sent from above Heaven's peace and perfect justice Kiss the guilty world in love Well, we're so glad that you're joining us today. Welcome. We're happy that you can participate with us as we, as we sing, especially now as we make much of Jesus, our Savior. Let's, let's pray together. Father, we are so glad. We're so grateful. We're so full of joy that we get to sing a song like this. The Prince of Life, our ransom, shedding His blood for us. Father, in this crazy and strange time that we live in, there may be times where we feel afraid or uncertain or worried. We're reminded, though, in 2 Corinthians that you are a God of mercy, that you are the God of all comfort. And because of what we've just sung about now, because of what Christ, because of what Jesus has accomplished on the cross, we can draw near to you, our Father. And that is what we want to do today. And so we praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. And so we want to, again, invite you to draw near to come with us as we continue to sing of what our Savior has done, of what He's accomplished. The Father wants you to draw near. His arms are open wide.
cross as you wait for the crown Tell the world of the treasure you found Hey church family, today we're starting our brand new series in the book of Hebrews and this series we're going to be starting online but continuing in person at church. We're so excited for you guys to join us. So come and check out our first episode. It's up on YouTube now and we're going to be reminded to keep paying attention to Jesus. Hope to see you there. Bye. Well, g'day and uh, good to be with you in the Word of God together. Next two weeks, we're going to be looking at the book of Ecclesiastes and uh, then we're going to be into our new series in Term 3 called Dear Church from Jesus in the book of Revelation. So, join me. We're going to have a look at the book of Ecclesiastes. Please grab your Bibles and uh, go to chapter 1. We'll pray, and we're going to look at the the passage together as we go along. So join me, let's pray, and ask for God's help. Father, we praise you that you're a God who speaks. You haven't left us in the dark, and we are so thankful for that. And Father, as we dig into your word now, we ask that you would speak to each of our hearts, no matter where we are, that you would expose us and expose our world for what it is and then open our hearts and minds to the truth of your son Jesus Christ and life in his name forever. We pray it in his powerful name. Amen. Well, are clever people actually that clever? Do you think wise people educated people are actually able to do life better than the rest of us. The more you know, the better life is. Is that how it goes? Well, turns out clever people are actually not that clever. Uh, An article I found called Clever People Are Easier to Con says that the more educated you actually are, the easier you are to be conned out of your money. Here's what uh, the writer says. Doctors, architects, engineers, and other white-collar professionals are being conned by email fraudsters who lure them into contributing to fake ventures after taking their details from conference sites. Educated people going to conferences, giving their details, and then they're getting scammed out of heaps of money. He goes on and says, a report on email scams indicates that high-achieving professionals are frequently defrauded, contrary to the widely held belief that the poorly educated and financially desperate are the most vulnerable. So, turns out, clever people are not actually that clever. Our world would say, the more you know, the better your life will be. Education is the answer. And more than that, the highly educated are somehow better than the rest of us, have better lives, make better decisions, are more fulfilled. I went to Churchland Senior High School and uh, during my time there, I actually remember one of my teachers saying to us as a class, we're probably mucking around, he said, be quiet. And he said, there's nothing more better than a good education. But can knowledge and worldly wisdom actually fulfill us? It's bigger than that. The question is actually bigger than that. Here's the question. Can worldly wisdom actually fix this world and save us? That's the question, isn't it? Can what we think, our brains, our intellect, our learning, actually fix the world and save us? If you know anything about the book of Ecclesiastes, you know the answer is clearly no. It's a funny one because Ecclesiastes uh, tells us where the answers are not. It also points us to where they are, but it has a massive go at every area of 
life. And the big question of the whole book is this. If you look out there at this world, just have a look at the world. Ecclesiastes calls it under the sun. That is looking at life without a word from God, without any kind of personal interruption from a personal God. If you just look out in the world under the sun, can you make sense of it? Can you find real lasting satisfaction and meaning? Well, where do we get the answers? Ecclesiastes will expose where the problems are. And the big thing it says to us is, there's nowhere under the sun where you can find the answers. Have a look. Let's look at chapter 1 together. If you've got your Bibles, read along. This is what it says. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labours at which they toil under the sun? There's our under the sun language. Generations come, generations go, but the earth remains the same forever. Sun rises, sun sets, hurries to back to where it rises, wind blows to the south, blows to the north, round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. Where are we? There it is. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full to the place the streams come from. There they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which you can say, look, there's something new? It was already here long ago. It was there before our time. No one remembers the former generations and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. What an introduction. This is the introduction to the whole book. Basically, it's saying everything sucks. Nothing works. Everything is meaningless. That word vanity, it literally means a vapor. When you get up in the morning, and it's cold, it's freezing at the moment in Perth, you get up and out comes this breath and you can see it for a second. It's vapour, mist. That's what that word means. Meaningless, vapour, mist. Why is life like that if you look under the sun? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? Let's go back to verse 4. Everything is meaningless. Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. Things just go round and round. You've seen that movie Groundhog Day. You get up, you do things, you go to bed. You get up and it's the exact same thing again. The sun rises and sets and hurries to back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and the north. Round and round it goes and it returns on its course. Nothing actually happens. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. It just keeps going round and round. To the place the streams come from, they return again. All things are wearisome. More than one can say. I get up. I do things. I go to bed. I get up. I do things. I go to bed. Life is on repeat. And it creates this uh, weary hunger for meaning. Verse 8. All things are wearisome. It's just... It's so tiresome. More than you can say. The eye never has enough of seeing. The ear, it's fill of hearing. Why is it that on my phone I've got 10,000 songs, but there's nothing good to listen to? I want something new. Why is it that Netflix and Stan and all these crazy uh, TV streaming things are, are putting out new content all the time? Because... The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear, it's fill of hearing. It tires us out. Life's on repeat. There's nothing new. Everything just goes round and round. My wife, Kenny, and I uh, visited Ayers Rock, known now as Uluru, on our way back from our honeymoon. We are coming back from Queensland. We had two hours in the airport. And so we got out and walked as far as we could to see the rock and then got back on the plane and kept going back to, to Perth. But I heard of a bloke who took his family uh, up the rock when they used to do tours of the rock. And one of the guides told him 
that they call the tourists ants. And it became clear when he got back to the tourist bureau, there was a video on a big screen there taken from looking down on the rock and looking at the tourists coming in their buses. And they'd come in, but it was all sped up, right? So the bus would come in, the people would get out, go up the rock, look around, come down the rock, get back in their buses. And it was on speed dial. So they'd come, they get out, they go up, they look around, come down and they go. They come, they get out, look, go up, look around, come down and go. That's what life is like under the sun. Generations come, generations go, the earth remains forever. Add that all up, what do you get? Life under the sun is like that stuff coming out of your mouth on a cold morning. But it gets worse. Such a, a depressing introduction, really, isn't it? It gets worse because now the teacher who we're told is king over Jerusalem, most probably King Solomon, he's got all this power, all this wealth behind him to now test his theory. This is what he does. He tests his theory on specific areas of life. That's the rest of the book of Ecclesiastes. We'll pick it up over the year when we come back to it later. But he tries to experience each area of life to its maximum, where you and I just couldn't afford to go nuts on one specific area. He does it all. And so we have an amazing book uh, that shows us uh, what life cannot give us. And so we begin now with wisdom and knowledge. Can our brains do it? Can our brains save us? And here's what we see. Under the sun, worldly wisdom cannot save us. Two things. It can't fix anything and it leads to death. The motto at uh, UWA, University of Western Australia, is seek wisdom. I went to UWA and got a degree in anthropology, psychology and philosophy. It sounds great, but then I went and worked for Australia Post delivering parcels. So you join the dots. The teacher turns to wisdom and he devotes himself to study, to exploring, to testing, to see whether wisdom and knowledge can provide real lasting meaning Can it save him? And it's not a happy quest. Have a look at verse 13 of chapter 1. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I've seen everything that's done under the sun, and behold, it is vanity. Nothing. Striving after the wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight. What is lacking cannot be counted. When you try and use your brains, go for knowledge. What do you find when you really have a crack at using your brain to solve life? What happens? Things are twisted and they can't be straightened. Things are lacking and they can't be accounted for. It doesn't work. Things don't add up. It's crooked, out of whack, doesn't make sense. You ever thought, I just, you look at something and just go, I can't understand why that happens. Why is it that there's enough food in the whole world? And yet millions of people are starving. Why is it that people kill each other because of what they believe? Why is it that famous people spend their lives making other people laugh and then they kill themselves because they're so depressed? Things are twisted. They're out of whack. They can't be straightened. And did you notice it's an unhappy business that God has given? What? God? God has given this? Why? This is deliberately done by the creator God on a world that is out of whack. Why? Well, we skip to Romans in the New Testament. It tells us because it uses the exact same word. That word futility is actually our word meaningless or vanity. It's the exact same word in there. For the creation was subjected to vapor, meaninglessness, life being nothing not willingly but because of him who subjected it why in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay 
and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. God has subjected this world to this brokenness, this out of whackness. It's God's doing with a clear purpose. Did you see it? Freedom. He has put this world in this place for freedom. Or what kind of freedom? We'll see. We'll come to that soon. But here's the thing for us. Can you see now why worldly wisdom cannot fix anything and won't save us? Because if you're trying to use your brain to solve the problems of the world, you're actually butting heads with God himself. If you're trying to use worldly wisdom, searching out and seeking by wisdom, all that is done under the sun, how things work, it just can't be straightened. You're not going to do it. Not, why? Because you're butting heads with God. Put your brain in a fight with the God of the universe. Guess who wins? But the teacher wants to push it further. So he says, okay, I'm going to increase in wisdom. I got to this point. I'm going to keep going to include madness and folly. That is the whole spectrum of life from its absolute most amazing to its stupidity. I'm going to try everything. Have a look. Verse 16. I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who are over me in Jerusalem. My heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to wisdom and to know madness and folly. He went to the other spectrum as well of wisdom, the foolishness of it. I perceived that as also a striving after the wind. For in much wisdom is much vexation, much problem, sorrow, grief. And he who increases in knowledge increases in sorrow. His learning just helps him understand that it's foolish, doesn't work. It's a striving after the wind. I challenge you to go down to Mullaloo Beach after this. Chase some wind. See how you go. What do people think of you? They'll laugh at you. That's what pursuing worldly wisdom under the sun is like, chasing wind. Why? Because you're butting heads with God. You're going up against the God of the universe and you're going to lose. The internet is a very clever thing, isn't it? Did you know you can sit in your bedroom and talk to someone on the other side of the world? I can type things in my computer in Perth, Western Australia. Someone in Antarctica can read them straight away. We did that. Human knowledge did that. We did it with our brains. We thought up the internet and all of its amazingness. And what has happened? We've increased in foolishness. More pornography than there's ever been before. More money is stolen. More people are stalked. More cons, more rip-offs. It's got worse. Why? Because with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. Under the sun, worldly wisdom cannot save us, can't fix anything. But it also leads to death. So the teacher picks up wisdom again in chapter 2, verse 12. And here's what he says. I turn to consider wisdom and madness and folly, the whole spectrum, from their most amazingly wise to the absolute fool. What can man, for what can the man who comes after the king do? Only what has already been done. Then I saw there's more gain in wisdom than folly. There's some good in it. If you're wise, you're like walking in light rather than darkness. The wise person has eyes in his head. The fool walks in darkness. And yet, I perceive that the same event happens to all of them. What happens? What happens to the fool happened to me. Why then have I been so wise? I said in my heart that this is vanity. For the wise as the fool, there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come all have been long forgotten. Here it is. How the wise dies just like the fool. So I hated life because what is done under the sun was grievous. All his vanity are striving after the wind. He takes it to his end, to its end, doesn't he? 
and he hates life. My brain can't fix this. And the wise dies just like the fool. Worldly wisdom ends in death. The same event happens to all of us. And it hits him personally, doesn't it? I said in my heart, what happens to that fool will also happen to me. Why have I been so wise? At my house, there's uh, stuffed away in a box is a piece of paper. And that piece of paper is a prestigious piece of paper. It's a degree from a university in neurosurgery. That piece of paper meant that that person had wisdom and knowledge. He had all the prestige and respect and privilege of the world. No, it's not my degree. I'm not doing a bit of neurosurgery on the side. It's not mine. It was my father's. He died when I was very little. And there it is, stuffed away in a box. Degree in neurosurgery. All the wisdom, all the prestige, all the privilege. What's it worth now? It's a degree of a dead man. What will happen to our education? What will happen to all that emphasis you've poured into? Learning. Gone. We leave our worldly wisdom in the grave. Worldly wisdom cannot save us. It can't fix anything and it leads to death. And you're thinking, man, this book is super depressing. And you'd be right. Yes, it is. But is there any hope? Yes, there is. You see, what happens if there's a wisdom from above? If you're a Christian, you already know there's a wisdom from above that has broken in to our world. Not under the S-U-N, not in the world as we see it. It has broken in with new wisdom. It's from God, the God who made everything. Because that is what we need. And that is what's happened. God's wisdom has broken into our world in the person of Jesus Christ. And so we see life under the S-U-N cannot save us. Can't fix anything, least of it. But life under the S-O-N, Jesus Christ, saves us. Christ crucified is God's wisdom to fix everything. Christ crucified leads to life forever. Have a look. Here we go. We we'll skip to the New Testament now in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 18. If you want to flick there in your Bibles, it's on the screen here. I'll read it. For the word of the cross is folly, foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is he? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Where are all the wise guys now? They're in the grave. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world. For since in the wisdom of God, the world, that the world did not know God through its wisdom. That's what it means. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Jews demand signs, Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, folly to Greeks, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, everyone, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Now, you may have heard this before. Yes, Matt, you tell, you know, this church tells us every week that Jesus is the answer. Yes, but how? How does Jesus dying on a cross fix everything? How does Jesus dying on a cross provide the power of God and the wisdom of God? Oh God, here's, what, here's how it happens. When Jesus dies, God breaks into our world and says, you're not clever enough to save yourself, but I am. You can't fix this, but I can. The cross is the power of God to save you. At the cross, Jesus says, 
I have taken the futility of the world, the frustration, the pain, the brokenness, the meaninglessness of the world of sin, of rebellion against God. I've taken it on myself. At the cross, God says to you, I will take the blame. I will take the punishment. I will fix this mess up for you. You look at the world and you see frustration. Everything's on repeat. Nothing new. We're like ants coming and going. I look at this world and do something to fix it. You look at the world. You see the mess you've made. I see a new creation. You see no meaning. Can't work it out. At the cross, I give you the deepest desires of your heart. You see everything's on repeat. At the cross, I make you live forever in paradise. You see there's nothing new. I make everything new. At the cross, what is crooked has been made straight. God's wisdom saves us. By Jesus dying on the cross, God's wisdom fixes everything and leads to life forever. Here's what it is. Do you see, it's not about what you know. It's about who you know. It's not about what you know. It's about who you know. The wisdom of God is a person. His name is Jesus Christ and he has done something to free us from the frustration and futility of this world, to free you from looking out there and thinking, oh, this is like vapor coming off my mouth on a cold morning. At the cross, Jesus becomes our righteousness. Have a look. 1 Corinthians 30. He becomes our righteousness, our sanctification, our redemption. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who God has made our wisdom. Your wisdom becomes Jesus Christ. That is righteousness. You are made right, even though you're in the wrong. Sanctification. You are made holy, even though you're not clean. And redemption. The price is paid in full. It is finished. Do you see how this changes everything? What is crooked is straightened at the cross for you. What is lacking in you is provided in Jesus. Well, let's finish up. A couple of things for you if you're a Christian. A couple of things for you if you're not. Firstly, Christians, can you see the tension? You live in tension. So here's what you've got to do. Embrace the tension and set your hope on the then. Embrace the tension now and set your hope on the then. Now and then. Don't be fooled. We're under two suns, the S-U-N and the S-O-N. It's like this overlapping at the moment. If you're a Christian, there's a massive tension in your life. That's right. It's going to happen. Things are still frustrating. Sin is still present, but Jesus Christ is your wisdom. He has died to fix your problem. So cling to him and his cross. Don't be moved from it. Embrace the tension. See the big picture. Jesus has fixed everything. He's made it straight. He's straightened your sin. He's dealt with your death and he will bring it to completion. So don't freak out when things are difficult. Things will be difficult. But Jesus remains the same. Cling to him and his cross. Romans 8 puts it like groaning, like a woman in childbirth. There's pain with a purpose. We groan, but then there's purpose. We hope for what we do not see and we wait for it with patience. So embrace the tension now and set your hope on the then. Secondly, don't make education the most important thing. Dear Christian, do you care more about a good education 
than Jesus Christ? Do you care more that your kids are successful at school, at uni, at TAFE, in their lives? Don't be deceived. Education is not the answer. So have a think. What do you spend most of your time and your money, your energy and your worries on? Is it getting more understanding for you or for your kids? Or is it on Jesus Christ? What do you worry about the most? Do you worry that your kids won't get through high school and go to uni and, or you won't be able to get a good degree? It's okay. Jesus is still in control. Or do you love to be right? Maybe you rely on your education to be clever, to be educated. Don't do it. It's not the answer. Don't make education the most important thing. If you're not yet a Christian, don't. there's a lot. There's a lot in this. Don't worry about any of that. Here's what you need. Can you see that the world is broken? Surely you can see it. Surely you can see that your brain can't fix the world. It can't fix your problems and it can't fix the world. The, the world is crooked. It's out of whack. Can you see that? Can you see that the world is not the way it's supposed to be? If you can see that, then you're in a great position to see God breaking in to fix it. So firstly, see the world as it really is. It's broken. But then don't stop there. See God's wisdom in Jesus Christ for you. Can you see what God has done for you? In Jesus Christ. He has come to fix your problem. He has come to die for your sins. To deal with your broken world. Your frustration. Your pain. Your suffering. Your death. Cannot be fixed by you. But Jesus does it for you. So come to Jesus Christ. Talk to a Christian friend. Hop online to northcoastchurch.org.au. Connect with us. We'd love to talk to you. Don't leave it till too late. This world is obviously out of whack. And God has provided the answer. So let's finish up. If you've fallen asleep at this point, tuned out, this is it. Listen to this. God in Jesus Christ says to you, You're not clever enough to fix yourself, but I am. You're not able to save yourself, but I am. God says to you at the cross, I have taken the punishment for this world that's out of whack and your wisdom will not solve it, but I have. You look at the world and you see frustration, you see everything's on repeat, you see there's nothing new. I look at the world and make everything new in Jesus Christ. You've made the mess. You can't fix it, but I can. At the cross, Jesus says, you're not clever enough. You're not able to fix yourself, but I have. So come to him. Trust in him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for exposing really our world and our own hearts. We are not able in our own brains, in our own wisdom to solve anything. We can't fix ourselves, let alone this world. And yet you have broken in Your wisdom in your son, Jesus Christ, has broken in powerfully in the cross and taken the punishment for our sin, taken the blame for our messing it up. We thank you that what has been crooked has been straightened in the cross of Jesus. Please, Father, help us to turn to him And trust in him for life forever. In Jesus' name. Amen. Upon his 
We hope that you've been encouraged by what you've heard today. I just want to remind us a couple of things that are happening in the life of our church. As I mentioned earlier, our physical gatherings will be kicking off on the 9th of August, 8.30, 10.30, 6 p.m. We'd love to see you there. 
Now in term three, we'll also be running a eight week course titled The Story of God. This course is in, run in partnership with Trinity Theological College. Our lead pastor, Dwayne Olivia, will be teaching for those eight weeks on a Wednesday night right here at our church facility. And if you're someone who's wondering, what is the big picture of the Bible? What is the Bible all about? How does it all tie together? Well, you won't be disappointed. Please do come along. All the details are available on our website. If you click on the events tab, you'll be able to register online and uh, we'd love to see you there. And just on that note, if you have any questions uh, or, or, or you would want to ask us anything, uh, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to connect with you. Uh, click on the I'm New tab and you'll be able to connect with us. Today we've heard that the wisdom of God is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Let's try to put our faith in Him. Let's continue to have our eyes fixed on Jesus. He is the wisdom of God. Thank you for joining us today. We hope to see you next week. Have a great week. Mm -hmm.